So I'm going to jump in tonight. The first session's always a little bit shorter, a little bit to the point. I got a lot of content to cover in a short amount of time, but what I will do is make the notes available for you because they're going to they're going to be quick hitters on the screen. I do advise you to take notes, jot down, you got a notepad there and a pen on your on your table chair area. What I want to do tonight and I usually use this night as a way to talk about very practical marriage. Marriage, I said Sunday, I don't believe marriage is hard. What I do know, though, is marriage takes hard work to make it right. So the actual blessing and communion of marriage isn't a hard thing. It's a beautiful gift from God. But what is hard is the work that you must put into it so that you have a healthy and sustainable marriage. So when the storm comes, I got like some country music playing in my ear somewhere, Scotty. There you go. Thank you, sir. Like I don't mind country, but when I'm preaching, I don't rather have a little gospel, you know what I'm saying? Like the Yes. No, I don't want gospel. I don't want anything. I just want to make sure. But, but marriage, marriage is something that God has blessed us with. It takes hard work to keep it right because you have two imperfect people who have come together as one. And there's nobody in this room that is perfect, and none of us are ever going to achieve full perfection, Jesus said, into the day that we are with him. And so until the day we enter into heaven with our Savior, we got to keep working on us and working on our marriage. So what I've done is I've put together 10 practical steps to a healthy marriage. And I know some of y'all are like, why well, can't you just make it three? If Ten doesn't even cover it, I promise you. But these ten, I feel like, cover a very good chunk of walking out a healthy marriage. I'm going to give you these principles along with a little bit of information and some scriptures to back each and every one of them up to. And my hope and my prayer for you today is that you could see some practical ways. Some of you may feel like only one really applies. Some may feel like all ten is needed. It's okay. All of us are at a different point in our journey, in our marriage, and all of us are here because we care about our marriage. Here's what I know. When you build your marriage on Jesus, when you build your marriage on the Word of God, I grew up, most of you know my testimony, I grew up very far away from church, single parent home, mom married five times, three kids outside of those five marriages, and I, did ha I didn't have a clue of what a healthy marriage looked like. I didn't have a clue how a husband should treat a wife and how I should expect to be treated from my wife. I had no clue how to raise kids. I had none of it. All I seen was chaos and everything that was done was done that was very non-productive of helping me become a strong, healthy young man. But when I got saved and I read the Bible, I felt like it was so beautiful and so amazing because I read in the New Testament, I read the entire New Testament in two weeks, and I learned so much. And one of the big things I learned was God is so caring about us that he gives us instruction how to be a good wife, how to be a good husband, how to be a good partner, how to be a good parent, and he makes it simple. So my, my hope today is to pull some of those biblical principles out in a practical way, give you some scripture to back it up with a little bit of notes to follow. So number one, and this is it, number one, this is it, this is it. All the rest matter, but they don't even come close to comparing to this. Put God first. Give him control of your marriage. Give him the authority to speak into your life and to help you be a better person and a better spouse. Give him the honor of trying his word and see how he instructs you to walk it out. But even beyond that, give him a place in your relationship. Spend time with God together. Church, prayer at home, maybe in the car instead of Keith Sweat. Maybe some worship music. And not always. Marriage doesn't have to be this corny, Christianized thing. 
You should listen to some Keith Sweat. Some RFTW. Anybody know what RFTW is in here? Come on, baby. Who said it? Come on. That's what I'm talking about. You, you need and you must allow God to have his place in your relationship. When you're hitting rocky times, when you're hitting tough times, you've got to be able to lean on God. Because sometimes it's hard to lean on one another because you're both messed up from the situation. But when God is the centerpiece, then there's always stability in your marriage. So God must be put first in your marriage in every way that you could possibly think of. Research shows that couples grow exponentially closer together when they involve spirituality in their relationship. This was a non-religious study. When, when I read the study, it was talking about any kind of spirituality, but they said that Christians seem to have the closest bond when they put their religion at the center of their relationship. Now, we know we're not looking for a religion, and neither is God. What he is looking for is a relationship. And he wants that relationship with you as an individual, but he also wants that relationship with you as a couple. And you have to just ask yourself honest questions. God, are you really first? You have to ask each other, do you feel that we put God first? And what would that look like in a practical way? It would mean that you would handle your spouse the way that God says to handle your spouse to the best ability that you can. Not the way you feel like. We're living in a world and a climate and an atmosphere where everybody does what they feel like and it's super dangerous. Because your feelings change every day. And if you react in the moment of feelings, you tend to hurt, offend, sin against the one you love the most. But when you allow God to be first and you put his word first and you make it practical by saying, I'm going to do my best. I'm not perfect. I'm probably going to blow it every night, but I'm going to do my best. Most of you know what my wife and I have been walking through with her sickness leading up to a seizure that literally killed her for over two minutes. That was the hardest thing I've ever faced in my entire life. I can't even imagine something worse. And I can tell you, if God wasn't the centerpiece, I couldn't stand here and speak to you today. I wouldn't be here to do it. So when we put God first, he's there. You know, the scripture talks about the two-stranded cord versus a three-stranded cord. The two-stranded cord is easily broken, but a three-stranded cord, it holds together. Why do you think stools don't have two legs? They got at least three because they're stable. And so we've got to put God first in our marriage. Look at this scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. You know what that means? It means you're in the right standing with God. It means you're living the way God has called you to live to the best of your ability. All of us, again, are in a different part of our journey in our Christian walk. But you're giving it everything you've got to walk out that right standing with God. And he, everybody say together. He will. It's a promise. God's giving you his promise. He will give you everything you need. You need patience for your spouse? He can give it to you. You need forgiveness? He can give it to you. Whatever you need, he's going to be there for you, but you've got to put him first. Okay? I want to take the most time on that. The next one I'm going to move through a little bit faster. Number two is work on you. It's a very practical thing that you could do to make your marriage better is make yourself better. Right now, we've had some couples that, that couldn't come tonight because they were sick. One of them is one of our senior elders. And I've been on the phone with them all week praying, standing in faith with him. He's getting much better, but he just said, man, I, I, I've never missed a marriage conference since this church started. I hate that I have to miss, but I'm just not well enough. If I show up, I might get other people sick. And I... I know what I'm going to be speaking on, and I said, you're preaching number two of my message right now. If you are sick, you're not good for anybody else. 
You make others sick when you're sick. So we have to be healthy. And I'm talking about soulfully, spiritually healthy. That we must remain healthy so that we can be the best us, so that we can empower and strengthen the one that we love and the one that we are with. If you're not working on you, and in some practical ways, reading your Bible daily in any fashion, we do the one-year Bible reading plan, but whatever it is that you do, just get in, even if it's just a scripture day, even if it's just listening to it in your car or next to your nightstand on the app, but get the word of God working in you because God's word is alive. It will empower you. It will help shape you. A prayer life is so important. And then there's some other very practical things like taking care of yourself mentally and physically and emotionally, but working on yourself so that you can be the best you because your health determines your production. What you produce out of your life is directly correlated to your health. And so you want to be healthy so that you can give, like John Legend said, all of you to all of whom or her. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. Come on, Ricky Bobby. If you're not first, come on. So run to win. Be a winner in life. Like, this isn't saying competitively against some other couple or even your spouse. This is saying work on you. Be the best you you can be. Do everything that you do with excellence and do it to win it. All athletes are disciplined in their training. Paul's given it. We know this is true, but he's given us 2,000 years ago. What is still true to this day, football, baseball, basketball, soccer, whatever it is. Here's the two recipes to being a winner is discipline and training. If you want to win at sports, you got to be disciplined and you got to train. How you practice is how you play. Right? And so it's the same way as working on us. And look at this. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So we're going to say these next few words together. So I run with purpose. Third part of our, our vision statement. Discover purpose within you. You've got to run with purpose in every step. And that shouldn't feel overwhelming. Don't feel like, oh, man, that sounds exhausting. It sounds exhausting if you're running for no reason. I don't run anymore. The Marine Corps ruined me on camping, hiking, and running. I don't run unless I have to. But when I have to, I'm going to do it with purpose, with every step. I am not, he says, just shadow boxing. Do you know that it takes more energy for a boxer to miss with a punch than it does for him or her to land with a punch? You will expend more energy swinging at the air than you will do in knocking down the enemies and the obstacles that are in your life. So keep working on you. Number three, work on, I know some of you want me to take the knowing away and say work on them, your spouse. But that's not it. Work on knowing them. Okay? Be in their world. Don't, don't have that. I, I hear this a lot, especially here in Texas. And I just, we're old school. We got an old school marriage. I'm an old head. We don't do it the way y'all do it. Well, but what about the way Jesus said to do it? Do you follow what I'm saying? Like, it ain't up to you. I mean, it is, and you can be miserable, or you can leave it up to him and be fulfilled. Work on knowing them. My wife and I are young, uh, still somewhat in that range, but especially to be grandparents. We got a grandson that's about to be two and another one that may be coming tonight in the middle of this message. Come out, child, right? 
But we're already empty nesters. We started being empty nesters five years ago. So we were, she was 39 and I was 40 when we became empty nesters. We had a commonality in our home, and that was our daughter. And we have a commonality, our church family. But, but now that Candace is married and living with him, <laughs> I do love you. But now, Melissa and I, we've had to be intentional about making sure that we really know each other in a greater way without a major common factor being in the home for us to focus on. And so we just started like high school sweethearts all over again. And what do you want to do? What's, what, what's your dream? If you could do anything right now, what would it be? And we just talk like that in, in different facets, but we go through that stuff because we, we truly do care to know one another. We want to know what we're thinking. You know, well, let, me, let me back up. Men, don't, sometimes you don't want to know what your wife is thinking. And if she ain't answering, just stop asking, all right? Good advice right there. Yes, 0%. <laughs> oh, man. But you thought you was at 50, bro. You thought you were. That is the epitome of marriage right there. That's a beautiful example of how things can be, all right? Work on knowing them, though. What are, the, what are your dreams? What's his dreams, her dreams? What is, what's going on? How are you feeling? What's, what's happening in you? What's, is God stirring anything in you? Or just get to know one another and make sure that you do this. Look at this scripture in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Don't be selfish. If the Bible isn't practical, nothing is. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. I read a book. I've read it a few times now, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And in this book, it talks about a man who is a billionaire, who's traveled the world, he's conquered all the big seven peaks, he's flown his own airplane, jumped out of somebody else's airplane. He's like that dude on the, what is the, the Mexican whiskey commercial, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, the most interesting man in the world. He's like that guy. But here's what everybody says about that guy, everybody. When he sits down at their table, they want to hear about his stories, but he refuses to talk to, about his stories because he wants to hear about theirs. And if a man who's done a lot and has a lot can humble himself and not want to impress others but truly want to get to know others, then we can do the same with our spouse. Because it says, be humble. Everybody say it together. Thinking of others as more than yourself. We're thinking of others more than we're thinking of ourselves. Number four, show respect for each other always. Never let go of this rule. Show respect to each other always. We've talked about, we did one of our marriage conferences years ago, you can get online, is love and respect. It's been books written on it, it's a biblical principle. The man must love his wife as Christ loves the church, and the wife must respect her husband as the church respects Christ, but respect also goes both ways. It's not saying that Jesus isn't saying, hey, men, you got to love her but not respect her, and women, you got to respect her but you ain't got to love them. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the priority of the two falls on individuals, but both are required to make this work. So show respect for each other always. Never, ever let that guard down. When a couple fails to respect each other, they often slip, this is a study, they often slip into negative habits. Research shows that nothing can damage a relationship quicker than criticisms, put-downs, and word curses. Paying your partner a compliment is a quick and easy remedy to show them respect. When you're tempted to complain about them to someone else, stop and ask yourself, how would you feel if you found out they were running you down to somebody else? This is a huge study they did, and they found that there's nothing more deteriorating than a, in a marriage than 
when you're just constantly putting each other down. I'm going to teach you this. I, I've never taught this at Reach. I used to teach it as a youth pastor. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not our culture. I know it's not in our culture. But I, I think it's just good to know this. Some people like sarcasm. Some people maybe just don't understand the difference between sarcasm and irony. But sarcasm in its true form, the definition of it is to be caustic or acidic, to eat away at. And so when we make sarcastic remarks to somebody that we love, we're usually doing it as a way to try to be funny to correct them on something that we need to deal with. Just deal with it. Don't be sarcastic about it. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not like you ever clean the house. Vod. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> no, but honestly, find a better way, and we're going to end it with this, but find a better way to communicate. Don't use sarcasm. If you look, I did this big study, and I pulled out every synonym that there is for sarcasm, and every synonym, match, synonym matches up with, with the fruit of the enemy's work within the church. And every single word that was the antithesis of sarcasm matched up with the fruit of the Spirit. So sarcasm is not a healthy way to communicate, and it doesn't give respect to one another. We're going to talk about that a little bit deeper as we go on. So let me just give you this scripture, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, the old golden rule. It's referred to that on purpose. <laughs> Do to others, everybody say it, whatever, whatever you would like them to do to you. Do that to them. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law of the prophets. You know what it's saying? The entire Old Testament brings you to this teaching. Treat others as you want to be treated. So we got to respect each other and put our best foot forward to one another and knock off all that sarcastic, undercutting, especially word curses. Don't call each other names. You might do it out of anger. If you do it, immediately just repent, cool off, repent, ask forgiveness. If you're the one that was offended, be a big boy or girl. Forgive and then walk it out, work it out, talk it out, but leave it behind you. But you know this is true. That old saying, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me. is the biggest lie we've ever taught kids in this country. It's not true. Sticks and stones... They heal up, but word curses stick to the soul, and they fracture the soul. So don't, don't belittle each other. Don't talk bad. Don't let nobody ever talk bad about your spouse to you, especially your mom. Okay? All right. Number five, learn, and this is now building off of it, learn to negotiate conflict. You are going to have conflict. You are normal. I want you to know this. Melissa and I call this intense fellowship. We have moments of intense fellowship with one another. This morning, I forgot to inform her that I had a very big deal that I had to be at this morning, dedicating a wounded warrior's home and I was going to be gone hours, and I'd been traveling to Alabama and just came home late, late last night, and she was excited, was ready to cook breakfast, and I'm like, I got I to gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> you know, she had a spatula in her hand. I was like, I'm, go I'm going now. <laughs> but that, that, that started to lead to an intense fellowship moment. And we both caught it within minutes. And we both just started laughing. And she said, you're terrible with your schedule. I said, I know. I, I, I am. I'm sorry. And she's like, well, just go and hurry up and come back. I said, okay, I'm going. And then when I came back, we finished the conversation to make sure there's nothing lingering around. 
And then we talked about, which we've been doing for a long, long time, how to get better at my schedule. And she reminded me, very lovingly, we've had this conversation 937,000 times. Can we not make it one more? Learn to negotiate conflict. There's another study. Conflict is a normal part of any relationship. There is a point, however, it can increase in intensity and become emotionally and sometimes physically unsafe. Working out problems in a relationship starts with understanding what your issues are and how to discuss them. And I'm here to tell you, get help if you need it. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Reach Church will pay for your first six weeks of marriage counseling, individual counseling at a counseling center here in Northwest Austin that is a Christ-based counseling center, and we will make sure that there is no stone unturned that you can get the help that you need to strengthen your marriage or strengthen yourself as an individual so you can be better in your marriage. That's available to you. I just want you to know that. Another practical thing about it is books. We usually have a book, and we'll have some tomorrow that we'll recommend to you. Sometimes we give them away. Sometimes we sell them. This time we just figure, let's just put a list together and get you guys a list of great books that you can use to pour into your marriage and to strengthen yourself. So those are good resources. I'm telling you right now, involving your friends is typically not a good idea. Your friend's going to side with you. You're their friend. And then they're going to get you all spun up, and then guess what? They're going to get second offense, and then you're going to go and play Tarzan in the bedroom, and then when it's all said and done, you're going to be over it, and your friend's still going to hate your husband or your wife because you hurt them, and they don't know that you easily forgave them. So always rule of thumb, when you're dealing with intimate relationships, always go up for help. Never go across or down. So in other words, don't go to somebody else who's got marriage problems for counseling and don't go to somebody that's not married for counseling. Go to a professional, pastor, counselor, whoever that would be. And up does not mean mama. Okay? Look at this scripture right here. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It takes two to make a thing go right. You came to get down. Listen now. Submitting, the word submit means to place yourself under the authority of another. It is your choice, but it's a healthy choice to do that with each other. That's God's way. Submit to one another. You don't have to always be right. You don't have to always have the last word. Learn to negotiate conflict. Be a listener. Be a listener. You know? Be a listener. And then be a talker. Be slow to speak. Quick to listen. And begin to no negotiate and navigate through that conflict instead of just letting it be a big blow up. Number six, forgive each other. This needs to be fast and furious. Don't hold on to grudges against your spouse. Walk it out, work it out, talk it out, go to counseling, whatever you need. But forgive each other. Pray together, trust God together, but forgive each other. If he or she hasn't already, your partner is going to do something to hurt you. Most times unintentionally. Or frustrate you or upset you. And guess what? You're going to do it too. Whether it be an argument, a misunderstanding, all of it left undealt with can build to unforgiveness. Forgiveness is an important virtue in a marriage, especially considering that no one is perfect. Try to allow your spouse some room to make a few mistakes so that you will also <laughs> have some room to make your own. And when you make a mistake, act quickly apologize, and fix the situation. Doing so will help encourage forgiveness and strengthen your marriage. I've got two scriptures for this because it's a big one. Colossians 3, verse 13, make allowance 
for each other's fault. Make room. We talked about Sunday. Make room. Don't, don't be tight. Be liberal. Be forgiving. Be, be bigger. Be, be available. And forgive. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. But let's look at this next one because it builds beautifully off of it. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. Always be humble and gentle. I'm going to say this about 30 times. Always be humble and gentle. We talked about the difference between humility and meekness. Meekness is the state of your being. Humility is how you show that to others. So be humble. Show them. You don't have to think less of yourself. You just got to think of others more. That's humility. Thinking of others more than you're thinking of yourself. And be gentle. I know for tough guys and tough Texas gals, this isn't a real popular subject. But I have come to know the Holy Spirit, and I have never one time in my life by the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit have I been dealt with harshly. And I've made plenty of mistakes. It's always the gentle whisper, the gentle prodding, the working on my heart. Do you hear me? That's grace. That's mercy. That's God. Be gentle. Don't be harsh. I talked about it last week. I think maybe just only in first service, so I'm going to say it again. The only time in the entire Bible that God promises you he won't even listen to your prayer is if you mistreat your wife, gentlemen. It's the only time ever. So I think this is a big deal to God. So be patient with one another. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And remember what love is. Love isn't how you feel. Love is not a verb or an adjective. Love is a noun. Love is God. And God is love. And love is patient and love is kind. And love is not jealous nor rude nor proud. Love does not demand its own way. Love does not keep record of what has been wrong. Love does not rejoice at injustice, but instead it rejoices when the truth wins out. Love is always patient. Love is always hopeful. Love never gives up, and love endures every circumstance. That's 1 Corinthians 13. That is the definition of love, which also means it's the definition of God, because God is love. You want to get to know God better, read 1 Corinthians 13, and you'll see his character. You'll see what he's all about. So that's what love is. We don't get the privilege to redefine what love means just because it's 2019. God is love. And so when he says, because of your love, nothing good can come from anywhere but God. And nothing of real love can So this is God. Make every effort to keep yourselves united. United. It's a big deal. It's something that I am huge on. Unity. Let's find the common ground we agree on instead of bickering about what we don't agree on. Same with a marriage. Find the common ground you agree on and work on the fringes on the stuff that you don't agree on. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. With peace. I think everybody in this room would absolutely love if your home was nothing but an absolute sanctuary of peace 24-7. Would you agree? Okay. I can tell you it's not up to God, and it's not up to the devil. It's up to us of who we allow to reign in our home. Whose sanctuary is it? And again, we're not perfect. We're working on it, but we're working on it. We're being intentional about it. All right? Let's move on. Number seven, look for the best in each other. Don't look for the worst. Look for the best. Celebrate the best. The scripture says, this is both man and female, beauty fades. Like you can't, 
You can't, you can't just trust what you saw when you were 18 or 17 or 30. What you got to do is fall in love with the human being, the person that is in there. You about to have a baby? You're walking like you might not be about to have a baby. All right. I'm ready. I'm going to hand the mic to Daniel and I'm off. Look for the best in each other. Be intentional about that. When you met your partner, you fell in love with some of his or her qualities. Over time, however, your view of those qualities may change. For example, <laughs> he may have had a great booty. No, I'm just teasing. He, he may have been really good at saving money when you met, and now you just think he's cheap. Give each other benefit of the doubt. Create a list of all the things you love about your partner. It will help you fall in love all over again. We've done this before in our marriage conference. We're not going to do it this time, but this is something you can do at home. Take a piece of paper, draw a line down the very center of it, and draw a thin line at the top to make two columns. And one column lists the things that you don't really care for that the other does or says. And then the other one, Write everything that you're madly, why you're madly in love with this person. And both of you do it. And then what you do is you take the paper, you talk about it, you walk through the things that need to stop, the things that we need to celebrate, and then you tear that piece of paper in half and say, we're not going to do this to the best of our ability, and from this point on, we're going to do this. Very practical, easy solution to help you do this. And I, I've got so many scriptures for this that it's gonna, we're going to be here until midnight if I go over to them, so I've made it real simple. You ready? If you want to learn how to look for the best in each other, look at the life of Jesus. He walked up to a prostitute and saved her life from being stoned to death. She became one of his greatest disciples. He walked up to a woman at a well that was there for the wrong reasons, looking for another man after being married five times and living with a man she wasn't even with. And he said, I don't, I'm not here to judge you. Go and sin no more. Grace and truth. That's the life of Jesus. He walked up to Matthew, the tax collector, the knee buster, the thief. He walked up to him and he said, come, follow me. Jesus saw the best in people. He never saw the worst. The only thing he saw the worst of is that religious spirit that attached itself to people. He always saw the best in people. That's the life you live. That's the life we should live. Number eight, be intentional with intimacy. And this is not just sexual intimacy. This is all around intimacy. Cuddling, whatever it would be. Just spending quality, intimate time together. Having intimate conversations. And it's not just one thing. But studies show this is crazy because this is why God, you know, you know how people got married in the old, old days? They fell in love or they got appointed, somebody they didn't even know until that moment. And they went to a tent and whoop, whoop, and they came out married. <laughs> there wasn't no big ceremony. It was a honeymoon. Then married. That was the consummation of marriage. And so it's a big part of your life. It should be a big part of your relationship because it's proven scientifically that the endorphins and the joy and the connectivity that's released in those moments, nothing else can do that but intimacy. And so we've got to be able to, to make sure that we are intentional with that. It does not have to mean sexuality. Often aspects of intimacy take emotional types. An example of emotional intimacy is creating a safe space for your partner to share his or her emotions without fear of judgment, ridicule, or correction. Learn the difference between both emotional and physical and practice both as much as you can. Offering your partner one type when they really need another can create some serious problems in your relationship. If your wife just needs to talk, son, and you, you don't want to talk, you just want to do, it ain't going to turn out well. Okay? 
But here's a good scripture. This is this is New Testament. 1 Corinthians 7 3. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual need. And his wife, and the wife should fulfill her husband's need. Notice it goes both ways. Somebody sent me, another pastor friend of mine sent me this crazy clip off of YouTube of some preacher preaching at a women's conference. A male preacher preaching at a women's conference. Just, that was already scary. And he's talking about lingerie, talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. And he said, when you want to do that, just start praying in the Holy Spirit and command her in the Spirit to do it. I'm like, dude, what the heck are you even saying right now? You sound crazy. Don't do that. You ain't, you ain't no wild animal out in the jungle, man. You, <laughs> she is a human being. It was a right to her to work it out. One another, but work it out. All right? Number nine, I don't want to spend any more time on that because I passed you. It feels a little weird. Okay? <laughs> Number nine, explore common interests. I'm going to rip these last two out pretty quick. Explore common interests. Men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. Men are... Women are from Venus, men are from Mars. We are two completely different creatures within the human race. We like different things, we laugh at different things, but there are some things we both like and we both laugh at. Find that and do it as much as you can together. Find something. I, I just left my pastor, Chris Hodges, he, he said this about he and his wife. He said, all right, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you all. You all going to laugh at us, but I'm going to tell you all, what we do, we have found one thing we both love to do. And we you know a bunch of his spiritual sons in the room, and he, he says, we go into the bedroom. I was like, whoa. He said, no, 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 don't go there. He said, and we put on Jeopardy. <laughs> and we, it's a true story. He said, we both love Jeopardy. That's one thing that we found we do, and that's just one thing. There's other things, but it was just a, a funny thing. I was like, you know you old when you both love Jeopardy. No judgment. I'm getting there. I'll be there one day. But it wasn't what I was expecting here. Okay? Explore common interests. Couples thrive when they share similar interests. That doesn't necessarily mean each partner will enjoy every activity, but it opens up the opportunity for great sharing and compromise. Do things separately. Doing things separately is not bad, but common interests are the important pillar to healthy marriages. A common interest may be cooking or eating or foods together, going for walks, playing cards, whatever it would be, movies, whatever. The goal is to have something outside of your family, of your day-to-day -day activities that you can enjoy together. And Galatians 6.10 says this, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Do good things for other. So in other words, you've got to bite the bullet sometimes. And especially for those who are of the household of faith. So you just got to bite the bullet sometimes and you got to suck it up. Like sometimes I just have to go shopping because my wife wants to go shopping. Okay, like when I really think about it, what is it really doing to me? I'm not decaying on the inside. My toes aren't falling off. I feel like they are, but they're really not. <laughs> Take my boot off and check. No, they're still there. Suck it up. Buckaroo, put a smile on your face. Watch her in the room come out with a couple of different outfits and say they, she looks beautiful in every one of them. You'll be broke, but she'll be happy. Okay. I'm going to move on. Number 10, improve your communication skills. The ability to talk and listen to each other is one major key to a healthy marriage. You should never assume you know what your partner's thinking. I say this to our staff. I say it to Melissa. She says it back to me. Hey, don't think for me. Don't get in my head and tell. Let, just ask me, and I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell you. But don't think for me. Like, you know, you know how it'll go. Little, little fight, little intense fellowship moment, you think you made it up, and then she's sitting there staring like this. 
Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. She got that stare, like so we call it a thousand yard stare in the Marine Corps. Like she's off there. You are, are the target. She's got a rifle. You're there. She's locked and loaded. And you're like, oh man, she hates me. She hates me. She's so still mad. She said she forgives me, but she didn't. Look at it. It's written all over her face. She didn't have to say a word. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm quoting a song right now. It's written all over. Yeah, it is. And you know what she's doing? She's thinking of shopping. And you're getting yourself all worked up. Next thing you know, you fly up off the chair and you're like, all right, fine. You want to keep this going? Let's keep it going. <laughs> and she's like, what? I know what you're thinking. How many times have you said that? I know what you're thinking. Do you really? Because I know that this. Half the time I don't even know what I'm thinking. Only God knows exactly what I'm thinking. And I'm trying to figure the rest out. So improve your communication skills. And this scripture says it all, and we're going to close with this. And guys, ladies, listen. This is the epitome. This is the apex of Christianity life. This is it. This is the top. This is the mount of everything. Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit. You want to learn how to communicate to your spouse in a godly way, in a healthy way? Then allow the Holy Spirit to produce this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, help me Lord, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. The fruit of the Spirit, when we go to heaven and stand before Jesus, you will not get into heaven because of what you've done on this earth. The fruit of your ministry, your work, the fruit of your labor does not get you in. You will not be judged by what you have done. You will be judged by who you have become. You will be rewarded for what you have done. When you're doing good works on earth, you're storing up treasures in heaven. But to access those treasures, this is why Jesus said, I don't know you. Somebody said to him, oh, I cast out demons, I prayed for the sick, I, I prophesied, I did this, I did that. Yeah, but I don't know you. Because when I look at you, I don't see a reflection of me. And the way that I see my reflection of me and you is did you produce these things? And none of us, well, some of us, Jeff and Melody probably definitely are, but the rest of us maybe not, are hitting all of these. I know when I read this list, I get, I'm like, Duh. like patience, oh, man, I feel like God just drives a knife into my kidney. Like, Duh. like I'm just getting shanked in prison. Like this is terrible. Every time I hear the word patience, oh, I know God wants me to, I know I get to get better, I know, I know. But when I'm driving, self-control, gentleness, kindness, patience, peace, joy, they all go out the door. Well, I just look at it, oh my God, I need to never drive again. Yeah, I need a helicopter. I need a transporter. But none of us are perfect. We're all being worked on. The Holy Spirit's working with all of us. But we have to be intentional about this stuff. And we have to be aware of it that we can get better and we will get better when we give God that place in our life. Do you agree with that? Can we give Jesus one big thank you for his word? I'm going to pray a quick prayer over you and then we are going to give a couple giveaways and get out of here. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the fun that we've had, for the food, for the fellowship, God. I just thank you for each and every one today that has come out and they have made a absolute decision to make an investment into their marriage. Lord, I pray your blessing upon them. I pray that tonight would be an amazing night, that nobody would be able to walk out of here with ammunition against one another. 
but we would all walk out of here self-reflecting how we could get better and just be open and honest and repentive in the areas that we need to do, both with you and even to our spouse. I just declare unity. I pray for provision and protection over each and every marriage, and I do pray, Father, that you would help each and every one of us by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the grace of your Son, that you would help us to fall deeper in love with each other, with our spouses, with those that we are doing life with forever, God, than we've ever been in our entire lives. Help us to see the best in each other. Help us to overcome our personal weaknesses. And help us, Lord, to be the family you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.